Right, I've already been through the five slides, okay. so I'll wrap through them very quickly. So I've this on the on the recording. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk today about special modelling in R, uh, and we'll try and cover two two topics, but probably we'll get through them both. And I'm prepared probably for both of them. I haven't had time. This is for the recording. I've been doing client work. <laughs> the benefit of the recording. Not confidential information, yeah. Oh yeah, okay, thanks. That's very bad of you. <laughs> Good point. Right, okay. Uh, right, okay, so we'll try and cover remote sensing and we'll try and cover habitat suitability modeling. Remote sensing is a classification problem, well both classification problems, but habitat suitability modeling is more about modeling um, the distribution of a species, whereas the uh, the remote sensing is looking at habitat cover and classifying habitats. Uh, remote sensing, have you heard of remote sensing before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I won't go through that then because I think everybody else has, uh, has heard me witter on about that already. But the thing is, uh, I'm using uh, all the RGB spectrum or also the. We'll, we'll, talk, the about that. we'll talk about that, yeah. 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 Infrared. Yes, yes yeah, uh, yes, near infrared as well. Near yeah, infrared, yes. Okay. So the Landsat, are you familiar with Landsat data? Landsat uh, as a, as a is program? It? Yeah. Okay, so it's a series of satellites that NASA and USGS have been sending. Yeah, but what's the resolution? 30 meters by 30 meters. Okay, okay. So it's for land use cover. It's not a spy satellite or anything like that. It's, it's quite, it is quite fine actually. 30 meters when you think about a satellite in the sky, that's quite quite good. It's high high resolution, but you can't uh, see trees. You can't anything. see cars, trees. You can't see anything. 30 meters is a swimming pool, and it's just bigger than a swimming pool if you imagine that kind of scale. So a swimming pool would be represented like two pixels. Swimming pool will be one pixel, a bit less half a pixel, 25 meters by ah, 12 yeah, meters. Yeah. Uh, Olympic size swimming pool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Olympic size. Oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> just under two pixels. Like, yeah, okay. Right. <laughs> uh, right, yeah, so uh, I've been using Landsat data as part of my PhD, uh, Landsat 8 data specifically, which is the latest satellite at, at the moment. There's another one going up in 2020, which will be Landsat 9. So these are all in the individual satellites. Are, are they increasing the resolution? I no. No, they're not, because it has to, it's for consistency that most likely is, so oh, that you can right. make temporal inferences. Um, I'm not sure actually about Landsat 9. They haven't in Landsat 8. Okay. There is, we're going to the, the, get the head out of ourselves here, but there is one band, which is panchromatic, which is a higher resolution. But it's usually, yeah, we, we, we can talk about that. Yeah, Landsat 9, I'm not sure. But to be honest, I didn't even know it was going up until the start of writing this presentation, so this is, yeah. this is new to me as well. Okay, right, so that's what a, this is where we're up to now, we're back on, on the same page. This is a Landsat scene, one image, okay, that's what it looks like in RGB, which is what no one was saying before. Yeah. It's not a photograph in the same sense as a, a photograph, there's 11 bands in there, there's 11 bits of data, yeah. you can see three of them, red, green and blue. And then there's some which are invisible at the moment, you have to actually select those. We'll talk about that. I have a slide yeah. specifically on that. Okay. Uh, this is an example of how the satellite images are taken. They're taken very regularly over the same area, over the entire world. Yeah. So this is the same satellite coming over and it's tracking and taking images frequently over the same space. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these will be sequential. They'll be like very, very fast after each other and then you'll have to go around the world another time and then take another set of images like this. So between one column to another column, yeah. uh, what is the time lapse between the two? It differs around the world, um, but I don't know, is the honest answer, I can't remember. It's, made it, but it's about two, I think maybe one a week or two a week, two images a week, so this could be a week or, or half a week. Between Later these. on? Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, 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 sorry, that's wrong. Be a week between the same Oh, so it's, it's, it's actually same. going very fast. Yeah. So that one is like a fraction of a second. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, these will be maybe a little bit longer for it to go around and come back. Oh, right. okay. Um, yeah. Uh, to be honest, I just use the images. I don't know much about the actual orbital uh, traces of yeah, the, but the actual satellites. Is, satellite is, is it true that the satellite uh, circulates the world six times a day? That sounds almost. probably about right. Yeah, I don't know. I, I would be guessing if I, if I gave you a figure on that definitively. Mm. Okay, this is just an example, it's Texas, I've never worked in Texas, never been to Texas, it's just an example, it's a nice big area to see how it goes, how it, uh, mm. there is overlap between these as well. So you're quite lucky if your study area only covers one bit in the middle of the overlap because you get twice as much imagery for the, for the money. So 
if you're doing temporal studies, you'll have more regular kind of imagery. Mm. Or do they account for clouds and noise in the atmosphere? We can talk about that as well, Chris. Very good question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Landsat is not just Google Maps. That's what one thing that I wanted to get across. It's not just a photograph. This is, this is where we are now. This is labelled. It's exactly the same. It's just labelled. That's one thing that you can use aerial imagery for, just normal aerial imagery, is to label your data. If you're doing a classification problem, mm. a supervised classification, yep. you'll need labels. And you've got labels. You know, you can you can look at these images, and we'll talk about labeling a little bit more as well. Oh, I forgot what this is. Right, okay. Are you ready for a yeah. bad joke? <laughs> Why? I think I've given you the answer to this already. Why is the Landsat 8 image the same as a music festival hosting Nirvana, Metallica, Radiohead, Nine Inch Nails, The Beatles, Arcade Fire, ACDC, Arctic Monkeys, Blur, Elbow, and Led Zeppelin? Because there's 11 bands. Yes! <laughs> they both have 11 bands. <laughs> I just made that all up and doing this before. That was quite good, actually. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this is a, a comparison of Landsat 7, which was the, the previous satellite. And I was saying just before you came in, Norman, Landsat 7 broke in 2003 when um, the tracking uh, went off. It's the image kind of uh, tracking went off, so the lines are, are out to kill. So not, I didn't use Landsat 7, even though it covers the period that I want. I, I wanted pure images, which was Landsat 8. But there are comparable bands, they're called different names between them. Um, <laughs> you still have it in mind? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, coastal aerosol, which is kind of above blue, uh, green, red, near infrared, shortwave infrared, thermal infrared, panchromatic, and cirrus, which is uh, used for cloud protection. So there's a lot of different information in there. That one image, so you, if we look back at our Google Earth image, you imagine 11 layers, there's 11 predicted variables for each pixel. So that's quite a lot of data, you know, you've got 11 inherent predicted variables. And you can derive other variables from these as well. People do what are special indices for vegetation, which Norman probably has heard of, um, and various other things. So there's like modified soil adjusted vegetation index and things like that. So it's, it's very useful for looking at land use cover land use change or natural changes, so forest cover, things like that. Um, but it was Landsat 8 that I used. So these are light wavelengths. doesn't really matter what they are. The names are enough. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so yeah, your spectral bands, those 11 bands, are predicted variables effectively. can be used to perform unsupervised classification. Some people do that. Often used to perform supervised classification, which is what I did. Where do the labels come from, which is what we're talking about? Well, you can either sit at your computer with a, a Google Earth or whatever you want images and say, right, that is that, that is that, and then you collect your training data that way. You can go out in the field and ground truth it. That's me in the field. That's me in Peru. <laughs> <laughs> with a machete. Wild, yeah, yeah machete and hoe. Yeah, that's a long time ago. Anyway, so yeah, but that's, that, that, that wasn't to do with the project that I did in the Pennines, obviously that was another project, but basically in the Pennines I was going out and collecting field data. So you go out, you look at fields, which is what these polygons are, you look at a field and you say it belongs to this habitat category, it belongs to this. You do it all on transect, so you take a subsample of your area, and there uh, you've got training data. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. So these are actual fields at the survey, and they're the actual habitat categories, so we know they're right if they've gone to that field and seen it. Okay. A bit more about this map here. It doesn't mean a lot in itself to you. I've been staring at this map for years, and I forget that uh, people have no idea what that is. That is the South Pennine Moor Special Protection Area, this uh, hashed bit. Below this is the Peak District. You know the Peak District? Yeah. Oh, it's Peak just, District. Yeah. Um, it's a, an area of upland habitat in north of England, which is near from where I'm from. And that's where I did my, my studies. It was on the east side of, uh, of the Peak District. We were interested in not the actual uh, protection areas themselves, but the fringe areas. We were interested in the areas around the edges. We were funded by three local councils. They want to build houses, want to give planning permission for wind turbines and things like that. We can't build them here, it's protected. 
but they can build here. Hmm. Or they can grant plan permission to build here and they were having a hard time knowing when to say yes and when to say no based on the fact that this is in close proximity to this protected area. How does it affect the integrity of the protected area and the species within it? Okay. So that's enough for now. Uh, so you, all you need to know is we've collected training data. Labeled data. Labeled data, yes, yeah, so it's training and testing. Actually, we'll split that later on. Mm -hmm. So it's labeled data uh, within one kilometer. And we basically want to infer the rest of it, this, this one kilometer mm. band, we want to infer what's there. The white area? The white area is just the county, that's the county, it's just, a, it's just nothing. Yeah. It, but I originally had an OS map on there, it was too busy, I was told in my uh, viva to get rid of it, so that's what I did. Ah, oh, right, okay. <laughs> they didn't pay you to do your PhD for that, so. <laughs> exactly, yeah, 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 basically, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so they, These are councils, Kirklees, Colberdale, and All there's right, actually okay. two others of these maps, there's Bradford as well. Okay. There were the three councils that I was involved with. Okay. Do you collect all that data or is it multiple people? This is, I actually didn't do these surveys that were done before I started my PhD, these ones. Oh, yeah. uh, I did collect some data, mostly bird data. So the data are labeled pictures. by somebody else? Yeah, labeled by ecologists, okay. professional paid ecologists. Painstakingly. Painstakingly, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, it's not an easy job. So your problem is to fill in the gaps? Problem is to fill in the gaps, yeah. So you, you know these fields are this. You want to know what what's in because it's a big area. It's a yeah. very big area. Mm. You can't survey the whole lot. Yeah. That's 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 what we're sensing in this this instance is all about. Okay, so on to Chris's question about dealing with clouds and water. We're only interested in terrestrial habitats here. So you know, water is water. It's just water. So we can mask that out. It's not really relevant. I'm going to add it in later, the water bodies don't really change and you know exactly where the axis of map is perfectly. Yeah. So, in your predicted variables, ideally you want complete coverage of the area, otherwise you can't infer what's there. So in the Landsat data you want complete coverage of the area that you're trying to predict into. Yeah. How do you do that? Especially in an area like this, I haven't got any examples of a cloudy image, but I can probably, can I use your browser on here? Okay. Uh, which one do you prefer to use? Um, you, oh, you ready? Whichever one you like. Would Chrome be better for searching? It's just like for an image. I'm just going to search for it. Yeah, okay. Right. Is that okay? Thank you. We'll just search for cloudy plants. Let's see if we can find a cloudy image. Was it the yeah, it's dark, like in the northern part of the world, it's dark half of the year? Yeah. You will find out. Well, I won't actually, I've already told you. Like, there are well, algorithms for correcting for low light and for, for changing it. So, mm. In terms of nighttime photos, well, that's actually something I don't know. No. I, you don't get nighttime photos, so it must only take daylight hours. Mm. So it must mean that the data is missing for half a year in, 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 in the extreme north. Hmm. That's interesting, I don't know. Uh, I would like to find out. Well, maybe the, the, the some of the infrared channel will be useful. Possibly, yeah, yeah, but I've never seen a nighttime photo, which is interesting. Have you uh, just worked on your own area? Or but you, I, I've, or, I've, I've scoured every image that's available in a certain area, so I should have seen some nighttime photos. Ah, right, okay. But I haven't. Which is interesting. Anyway, so there you go. That, that's, that's someone else's image, Christopher Hain, Mother Christopher. Uh, and what he's done there by the looks of it is looks like rainfall. Okay, so yeah, he's got he's, he's trying to categorise rainfall into or, or soil moisture or something like that. Millimeters per day would be would be rainfall. I don't know why it would differ between fields, so it's probably not rainfall. But that's what the clouds look like mm. uh, when they're masked. Actually, mm. um, obviously they look like clouds in an aerial image when when they are there. Yeah. So like. That's a bad example, but that's basically what they look like. It looks like a cloud with a shadow. Mm -hmm. When you mask it, you have to get rid of those areas that are useless. Yeah. Because you can't make inferences about the one that you can't see. So you just write it, there's, there's algorithms to get rid of them. Yeah. Mask them all, but then you've got missing data. Mm. Okay, so that's a problem. Okay. Especially in a really cloudy area. The Pennines is extremely cloudy. <laughs> like the majority of, of the area is, is cloudy a lot, of, a lot of the time. So, you can you have to create a composite of many, many images. Are there, and then you average them out. 
So I, this is a nice tool and something worth knowing about. Oh, oh I can tell you the Landsat is free. If anybody can access it, it's free. Maybe tell you about that latter tool, which is amazing. Landsat images are free. Yeah, to download. Yeah, yeah. Across the time. Yeah. It used to be fee fee paying only. Did it? I don't know. I mean, it used oh, to be that. Yeah, it's pain. always been free, as far as I could. I think part of it was the fact that it used to be so damn hard to extract and uh, interpret that anybody who had the time or energy inclination to do it they just enjoy it while it lost. <laughs> yeah. Trump might stop it. Well, yeah. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. We can yeah. make money from that. Yeah. Oh, really? Wow. GPS as well. Yeah. <laughs> who knows? Yeah. Anyway, so back to there's a tool called Google Earth Engine. Which mm. is, is brilliant. Google have, um, well, it's, it's, it's just a really useful tool and it surprises me that they've, they've got this free engine that you can use which has access to a portal to all the Landsat data. Oh, there's a portal, yeah. It is Google, a, it's okay, a engine. portal. Oh, it didn't a. used to be. When I started about PhD, you had to download it in a different route. This is only, I only found out about this this year. Oh, I don't wow. it is. But you write it in JavaScript. To grab the image. To, to, to do all sorts of stuff. To do all sorts of stuff, you can that, grab the image, you can correct the image, you can crop the image, you can you can actually do algorithms in here. I haven't got that up there, yeah, but you can, inside this environment. Yeah, you what can do predictive it? modeling, JavaScript. Oh, yeah. just JavaScript. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Obviously, the the, the models probably aren't like the ones running JavaScript. They'd be running Python or something like that. But the the interface is JavaScript. Uh, yeah, and it, it, it's a really good tool. So you you. Upload. I uploaded a, a mask of my area, which you can't really see here, but that's basically the fringe. So I uploaded a, 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 just a, a picture of the mask, no, nothing, no data, just a mask. You put it in here, you say, I want all Landsat 8 images from this date to this date in this area. Pull them, it'll pull them, that's what these are here. There's actually hundreds of them, 228 images in that area between. <coughs> Uh, I ended up doing three years, uh, 12, 20, 12, 13, and 14, I think it was. So it was looking for images across those, that time period. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what it does is it composites them. So you, well, you write an algorithm to composite it. So for each pixel, you do the cloud mask first, the remaining pixels in any one area. It's, they're always aligned, the pixels, every image every time is aligned. Well, silly question. I didn't yeah. quite draw. How do you know a cloud is a cloud? Is that because you look at what particular band? The algorithm's been written for that. It's a very trusted kind of cloud removal right. algorithm. It's, it's to do with the reflectance. Yeah. 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 And the, the, yeah. yeah. So there's an actually metadata that where we get is already you know, some metadata attached with x to each pixel. Yeah. 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 You know, this is cloud, this is vegetation, this is. Oh, really no, 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 that kind of metadata. There's, there's overall metadata for the, for the image, and then you've got the spectral values. Oh, okay. Right. So you can infer from there. Yeah, there are algorithms which say if this is within this range, these values, then that's cloud. Okay. It's basically just white, I think. Like you say, if it's if it's too washed out, it's a cloud. Mm. And you can remove the shadows as well in the same in a similar way. <clears throat> um, anyway, so yeah, that's that's what I did. You average it out. So you, you might find that in some areas you've got two pixels left out of hundred and whatever it is, because there's been clouds in every day apart from those two days. But that's okay, because you take an average for each band, mm. and then you use that as your, as your final image. And it works really well. You end up with a complete coverage area, which is representative of a certain period of time. Okay. Okay. So that, that's enough. Just, it just be, It's good to be aware that that tool exists. If you ever have to do any, I imagine for people especially, like, you know, it's, it's, it could be, could be useful, potentially, if you're looking at... Uh, vast areas of land and trying to make inferences from yeah it. they they do studies in topography that's what I used to do but we don't use the free NASA okay we already use like a paid one yeah, which better. is higher resolution yeah 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 that, that's the other thing yeah. worth mentioning is that if you've got the money you can buy a better image. yeah exactly I I used to the the one that's higher resolution yeah. Modis or something yeah. uh, no. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, I can't. I can never remember what to call. I've never used them. Never had the money to do it. <laughs> and I never had to adjust anything. I just received. Well, like actually, that. I will mention that as well. Um, you, you're quite lucky uh, nowadays, as far as it's called the Level One T project for products from NASA. So it's corrected already, topographically corrected, and uh, radiometrically calibrated. So time of day is corrected for the. The high elevation, everything's corrected. It's an image that you can use straight away. Mm. You might have to do something like this, but you used to have to do some proper processing on it yeah. to, to get them comparable. Mm. 
but that's all done so here, yeah. Land sat in, level one T. Top of the atmosphere, that's done so right. Top of the atmosphere corrected as well. It, yeah, it's a, there's a lot a lot of stuff you can do, but that is already done by NASA. Anyway, so we'll move on to the spatial stuff in our, or spatial stuff in general, I'll introduce you to first. So we know about the, the Landsat side of things, um, the, how you can use those for classification. But obviously, now you need to know how, how do you do that classification with a spatial element to it. Uh, well, you use GIS, which is Geographical Information Systems. You use that to pre-process your data, pre-process your data, make sure everything is aligned. Label data has to be aligned with your predictive variables, all those kind of things. The manipulated data, we'll talk about that. GIS is a big, big thing. You know, it's it's, it's um, well established discipline in, in the geographical sciences, and it's uh, just a way of digitally representing data, spatial data. So that's the catch all. So you can create maps, cartography, or you can do analysis. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big field. Yeah? Okay, then ignore the other stuff. That's from a, a lecture that I was given at the university. It's not really relevant. Did you ever look into using drone footage? You can, uh, people are using drones quite a lot now. You can get multispectral drone, drones, mm -hmm. or drones with multispectral cameras. Yeah. And that's a really, really upcoming field. I'd really like to play with it as well. Yeah, great for, uh, for high resolution kind of imagery over relatively small areas, farmers' fields, things like that. I think there are companies that analyze farmland for, for farmers to see what they want to see. That's, it's pretty cool. Okay, so, right, so in terms of GIS, data formats are a little bit different to what you might be used to. There's four basic ones, points, lines, areas, and rasters. Okay, they're, they're obvious what they are, they're just points. So if you imagine the normal graph, a scatter plot, they're points, it hasn't zip, you know, it has one dimension. Okay, it's just, just one point. Line has direction. Uh, that, sorry, that's zero dimension, that's one dimension. Um, so yeah, it's just data, data captured that gives a line. These are all, if you imagine a map or what you want to describe the Earth's features as, in, as, as a flat thing, then you can do most of it with these. Poly areas, polygons, obvious. It has a footprint in two dimensions. Rasters are what we've been looking at. It's just a series of pixels that have values. Okay, so it's that's all it is. Uh, it could be an image. That's the most common. Landsat is is a raster. Regular pixels with with uh, with values. Yeah. Okay. Geographic projections. So another thing that you need to think about. Okay, so um, depending on where you get your data from, um, it may not align with some other data that you get. If you get data from the US and you get data from the UK, um, they'll be in a different geographic projection. So if you imagine trying to align the data, so if, if you've got British grid data and you've got the UK, so that's just on British grid, it's fine on its own. Any, any data that you add to that has to be in the same format as this geographic projection. It's a way of representing a round surface as the Earth on a flat plane. Very complicated, I won't go into too much detail, but imagine if you got some data from the US, it could be over here like this. If you try lining it up, which makes it useless for comparison. But you can convert between the two, you just got to be aware that if you're using spatial data, this is with any spatial data, they always have to be in the same projection or geographic coordinate system. Okay, right, so we can go over to R now. R is great for uh, GIS stuff. Do you need the R notebook? No, no, it's fine, I've got a notebook. Um, mm. Worth mentioning that traditionally there are other programs and tools that people do GIS in. ArcGIS is a proprietary one, which is a massive map info used by local authorities and stuff like QGIS is hyphen. Uh, um, and it's open source. ArcGIS is actually really proprietary as well. And then there's R. R's great, it's open source. You've got massive statistical modeling capabilities, great graphical capabilities. And it really is a lot of uh, spatial ability as well, like the people that produce this stuff. North Face Art has, has uh, spatial capability design in GIS as well as everything else. Okay, so it's a bit warm in here, isn't it? Uh, how do I get to my folder? Sorry. Oh, your folder, yeah. Yep, yeah. Because I thought it was on. 
my wife at home. So what do you want to go? Okay, so if we go to... I'll talk you through some analysis that I did for my corrections. There you go. So you got HTML for a thesis? No, no, this is just a note, but it's written in, in our markdown. Oh, right, okay. Just, Generated in our markdown. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is going to be quite dry. This is where my preparation ended. I did those other slides this morning. So I'll talk you through it and what you can do, and you'll probably walk away thinking, what on earth was that all about? Okay, so R, um, there are several packages. Packages are mod the modules in Python? Modules? modules? Mm -hmm. Something. Libraries as well. Okay, so yeah, in R they're called libraries. You, you can call packages, but you can load them as a library to use the function library. But um, raster. RG, DAL, RG, US, those three. Uh, the only three that you'll need to know about really in terms of basic um, mm -hmm. manipulation of spatial data in R. RS Toolbox is a really nice package. That's what I used for, for this. It's remote sensing toolbox. It's somebody's written a remote sensing library. Mm -hmm. uh, Carrot, if you ever want to do any modeling in R. Uh, it's machine Carrot. learning. It's machine learning, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got, it's, it's modeling, it's classification regression training. Mm. So yeah, useful for machine learning, useful for, for all sorts of modeling. It's a nice framework, it has about 260 different algorithms in there to be updated regularly. It's great, really nice package. Okay, so the rest of it is just both stuff that I need to yeah. set into multiple processes and things like that. Uh, so yeah, you can re read in your spatial data into R and just plot it, it's always a good idea to plot it. To see what it looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my. That's the same thing that you were looking at before. Just zoomed out. So let's see. That's Ilkley Moor up there. Have you ever heard of Ilkley Moor? Bartat on Ilkley Moor. Um, yeah, that's that's all that's doing. It's always a good idea to visualize your data and check it. Uh, the councils as well. They'll the councils areas. They overlap with each other. Checking to see if the numbers from down the side are the same. I will have actually plotted those on top of each other as well to make sure they align. These places already in the library have to make No, no, I have imported this yet. So okay. it's a good point. <laughs> the file format, the standard a standard A standard file format is shapefile. So it's actually yeah, it used to be proprietary for the ArcGIS, but you can use it in, in you know, you can use the most file formats in our spatial mm. file formats. Mm. Uh, so yeah, you read in your own data and then you would belong with it and say you would have any data. So is it a public uh, file? SHP, you can always download some, find and download somewhere? Uh, there are, there's lots of free data, lots of free spatial data available, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 in terms of bound, boundaries especially. Actually, that's a good point. I, I downloaded that from uh, from JNCC DEFRA, which is the government, or, uh, government body, uh, DEFRA. Department for Agriculture and Fisheries, or Fisheries and Agriculture, whatever it is, Rural Activities, I can't remember what it stands for, but yeah, it's, um, it's from a public repository. Yeah. The same with the councils, and the council board as they came from Ordnance Survey. Okay, so yeah, and then you do a bit of manipulation, so in our, you drew a one kilometre buffer around it, that's a standard GIS thing, you say I want this is the outline of my polygon, draw a one kilometer buff around it, and that's my mask. That's what I sent. I sent that into Google Earth Engine mm -hmm. to extract the data. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so what, what's the interest to look at just the boundary? Because, the purpose, yeah. because the, that's uh, the protected area in the middle is protected. Okay, nobody can build there. That you wouldn't ever get planning uh, permission oh, the, to build between the council boundaries, these are protected. So I no, no, I no. The, the point. This isn't the, the, the this. These are the council boundaries. They're not like say I haven't done any prep on this at all. This was written so for my own benefit. This notebook. These are this is the protected area. This is the peak mm. district. This yeah. is the South Pennine Moors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the councils have the cities here. This Huddersfield. Yeah. Uh, so there's Manchester's just down here. Yeah. Um, they want to build houses, they need mm. to build houses, they're under pressure mm. to build houses and renewable energy developments. But 
there's no reason they don't have any evidence to say that there's no reason why they can't build houses right up to the border they can build uh, on the border of the protected area so Obviously, now, now you're looking at the boundary or the, just the boundary of the boundary between the protected area where the, potential yeah, it's buildings it's are the transition there. zone between the other right, areas got it. Yeah. yeah so it's about gathering evidence to say look there's an effect mm. on the protected area okay the houses are within x distance okay so yeah that's the one kilometer buffer you can do all that in r right so once you've got your landsat data you upload it into r mm. and you don't need to visualize it again in here well it's always good to but with this being for my own benefit i've just used the figures to see whether it's aligned properly or not mm -hmm. so this won't mean anything to you at all basically i've split the um the images into winter spring summer and autumn mm -hmm. seasonal okay because uh, and then use those as predictors that makes sense with, it doesn't with, really it's just just accept that that's the way with the seasons uh render the pixels differently the seasons should be represented, they should look different, yeah. The, the, if you took, the reason I did that was because when we were talking about the composite image before, when mm. you take an average, you could do it across the whole mm. year. It's probably better to do it within a period where they're most likely to look similar. Yeah. You've know, got an av average spring. Makes sense intuitively, yeah. So Makes compare sense. winter to in winter, summer to summer? No, no, you, you, is it the, so the, you've got your 11 bands mm. in for each season, so you end up with 44 predicted variables. Yeah. Yeah, you've got eleven for summer, eleven for spring, yeah. winter, and month for autumn. So you use all those and it's actually quite a good thing because we I use random forest for this. So you get your variable importance scores, you can see which is a better predictor of the habitat in the or which is in which season is the habitat most different basically. So, so summer summer bands come out at the top, you say, right, okay, that's the best time. Is this a classification season. task? Yes. So what is the label output here? What's the output label? Here? We're gonna get to that. <laughs> okay. Right. So this is this is the input data. Right. What time are we in here till half four? I'm going to go and deal with yours. Yeah. No worries. Say hello from me. Okay. Um. Okay. So the fields that you saw before, you, you split those in R into training and testing using carrot, which is that package I was telling you about. There's no point in talking you through this unless you want to go through line by line. Uh. You need to make sure they're aligned. Now this is what I was saying about the coordinate reference system and projection to make sure they're identical, make sure they're aligned. In this case, they absolutely weren't. And you know, it's easy to fall foul there because a lot of people are just launch straight into the modeling and not check that the data is absolutely aligned. Mm. You might even get a result, but it'd be wrong because you're actually predicting your labels aren't aligned with your predictors where they should be. Mm. Okay, yeah, all the same stuff. That's cropping the Landsat data. So I've yeah, I, I, I've done it twice basically just to be sure. I've cropped it within Google Earth Engine and then I've done the same thing here. Uh, but your training data is used up like with your labels are from people going to fields. Yep, yeah, that's exactly How right. How do you cope with missing labels? Like patches without any people going there? Well, that, that's where we're predicted into. Okay. That's okay. exactly that becomes what we're doing. That's, that's where they, that's, that's where the spatial element comes in. Ah, okay. yeah. this is where your test data. Yeah, this is your test data where there's no. Mm, not all of it. No, yeah, the, 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 those fields that we collected. So they're easy just to draw it. We've got your fields. We've got your clean wall. Keep your strip down there. Your one kilometer band around this. Okay, so in here, say this is a this is a field. This is a field. This is a field. I'm not going to talk through the rest of this. It's pointless. Um, this is one category called mm. green. Let's go green, red, and blue. So three habitats: green, red, and blue. Uh, you, you select random points within those fields. Well, actually, across the board. So you have more, more, more fields than that. Um, but they will all be the same. Same. Then you take all those fields and combine them. So say this is one of 50 fields that are blue. Take those and uh, you randomly subsample the points. 
mm. to become your training and your testing data. So you you okay. actually just use all these points. You can sub all the label them. data become your training and test data for the purpose of exactly the like, yeah. model. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you can you can split it further if you want to. So you can use cross validation. Okay. You can use uh, you know you can use a, right, okay. a separate validation set to your testing data. Okay. It's, it's however you split it the same way as you do with any. Um, any predictive model, any any kind of machine learning or predictive model, if you want to test data, if you want to validate your set. <coughs> okay, so yeah, that's basically it. So the spatial element is the fact that you need to make sure everything's aligned. You need yeah. to know about ge geographical surfaces and things like that, mm. uh, or the Earth's surface, sorry, uh, geographical information systems. And then your points become your training and testing data. Yeah. And then your predictions mm -hmm. are into the space around it. Okay. Yeah. So you say this is similar to this is really similar to this. Mm. Or pre whatever. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Let's skip on to the the um, validation. So, are those the levels that you're showing? Yeah, the, the, I can carry on talking through this, but it's just dry because it's all text. But yeah, these are the labels. I actually reclassified the labels. Mm. Uh, these are the original field surveys. Mm. Uh, but some of them are really you only come across a certain habitat type once in a blue moon. You mm. can't use that as a category, so you just remove it or reclass it to a more suitable category. So, so you are categorizing different types of uh, habitat. grass habitat. Yeah, yeah, that, the animal problem. habitats, are hu not human. <laughs> not the shop. Habitat. Not the shop. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I can talk you through the different types of habitat. It might be better to do it when I show you the classification rocks and then show you the results now. Right, okay. 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 So only the do now is you're classifying uh, a, land, a natural land as different types of habitats. Yeah, basically that's it. it it's actually more, mm. there's a combination mm. of habitat stroke land use here. Mm. If you want to go into the theory behind it, um, the farmer's field mm. um, can be managed in many ways. Mm. If they apply it full of fertilizer, mm. then you call that improved, but improve the land. Okay. Oh. And it's, it has very low value usually for wildlife. It's when you see a nice lush field that looks really pretty and green. It's an ecological desert basically. You know, there's, there's nothing there other than that grass. Mm -hmm. Semi-improved is that it's probably been improved in the past. It's started recovering back to its more natural state. Okay. So it's better for wildlife. But improved would be that it's, it's never been touched. It's just nature. It's great for nature, bad for farming. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> so you, you wouldn't want to feed your, shit, feed your cows in there, but you, it's great for wildlife. The, the reason that's interesting is because the, the European Union subsidizes farmers for keeping their land unimproved or, or you know, good for, good for wildlife yeah. you know, systems, monetary systems. Yeah, God knows what's going to happen to wildlife after we leave the EU. Don't know. Another story. Okay. Right, so this is all just pretty processing. So that's the, they're the points. These are all points sampled from the fields, and then you split that in half randomly for your training and testing data. Mm -hmm. And the number of pixels in each habitat category. Okay, so it's the the end up is quite a lot of data. You know, you're looking at millions of pixels. And so each observation is a pixel. Each observation is a pixel. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I've set I've set a of <coughs> forty four dimensions. The 44 dimensions exactly yeah yeah i actually added another layer in here a, a digital terrain model so um and, mm -hmm. and that i did the predictive power so it's the landsat plus an elevation level so it's a topography of the okay just, uh, just to confuse things even more really this is what's contained in 11 you said elevation model is that part of the 11 features there no, no, that's an extra layer that I put in. Ah, oh, so um, you, you, you include the elevation information? You can include whatever you want in these things if you think it's going to have good predictive power. All right, OK. OK. okay. Landsat is, I use that as a basic, just just to introduce okay. it to, to a sense in the yeah. OK, Anderson. Yeah, cool. OK. So that's the training and testing data in terms of numbers. Uh, and then you run a random forest. Mm. OK, so yeah, there's, th there's actually 37 predictors there. Um, why are there only 37? Uh, they... Oh, I took out uh, three of the bands in each of the seasons because you don't want clouds, you don't want the coastal air, it's all bands. You could, reduce, you should probably reduce, see, look for um, uh, collinearity between those. Um, 
to be honest, I didn't for this. Uh, I did for the species distribution models. You don't forest. bother if you don't, if you don't use regression, uh, linear, you don't use any linear. Regression. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, so it's random forest. So yeah. it's not, it doesn't matter, just chuck it in. And it, it may be beneficial if you're worried about processing time because mm -hmm. uh, you reduce the number of variables and reduce okay. processing time. But yeah, it's not an issue with, with my super duper lot. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so run a random forest and then you get your accuracy and I'll, sh I'll just show you the output from my thesis. So that's a confusion matrix. Uh, with yeah yeah it's good isn't it yeah yeah thank you cheers yeah <laughs> so it's got six habitat categories you normally see confusion matrices with with binary cost matrix and that's the yeah, most common but you can do it with as many categories yeah. as you want and the overall accuracy is really really quite good actually for um for a uh, for a sensing kind of study ninety three point one one percent eighty is mm. acceptable in terms of mapping it's quite good as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to give you the data because I'm going to try and publish that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's really it's good because you're distinguishing between improved grassland, semi-improved grassland, like I said, yeah. and uh, that, that that's really good. Like if you can say, well, the, the land is degraded by this much, or it, and when you've got temporal data as well, you can do that over several years and say. Yeah. You might uh, improve habitat as you and, and you haven't exploited the prior knowledge about partial de spatial dependency. You mean spatial also spatial correlation. De correlation. Yeah, yeah, you don't you haven't actually explored. No, not 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 in this. In, in terms of spatial auto correlation, uh, you can you can explore it. You can do Cohen's kappa things like that, and uh, and, and, and hence uh, smooth up your predictions slightly to make it better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. The problem is that the. Uh, well, no, it's not really a problem. It used to be a problem with the old categories that some of the categories didn't have much data at all. Uh, some of the classes didn't have had a few pixels here and there, so I didn't want to take the data anymore. But having removed those, um, I, yeah, I will be looking at that spatial auto spatial auto correlation. For people who don't know what spatial auto correlation is, it's the tendency of like things to be oriented near each other in space. Mm. Yeah. Which way. makes sense. Yeah, it does. So houses are more likely to be near other houses, not near, not near other houses. Aggregation. Um, and you have to be careful or you can have implications on your model. But this is on testing data, this is the accuracy on testing data, so it's quite good, it's transferable. It's okay. And you can see there, there the habitat categories after prediction. So uh, I just trans transpose the uh, the model onto the entire area, and that's what the maps look like. <laughs> okay, so you went with a habitat map yeah. with your six categories, and then buildings on top of that, which you can get really detailed building data in, in this country. There's no point in including mm -hmm. the classification, you just mask it and add it afterwards. Uh, Black is water bodies, not interested in those. There is a separate algorithm for uh, masking water bodies, but I won't go into that, just the mask. And yeah, that's that's what it looks like. So you can see uh, the the blue is improved. Mm -hmm. Massive blocks. You don't want it improved, especially this close to the SPA. Really, mm -hmm. this is meant to be like kind of nice habitat, mm -hmm. you know, like up on, on a more of a full full wildlife. It's interesting when you start looking around the edges. So this yeah. is this is a uh, Ilkley Moor here. Semi-improved species, poor grassland, which is kind of okay habitat. You can see it's kind of being. It's close to the, the protected area, and then as you move out towards the edge, you've got more improved grassland, but there's kind of overlapping possible encroachment there, which would be interesting to explore through temporal data to see how this has changed over time. Mm. Is this blue moving towards the, the protected area, or is it not something to explore yeah. in, in the future? Yeah. So how accurate would the algorithm be uh, if you apply to a different geographical location. It wouldn't be very accurate at all because the habitats. Um, well, some of these habitats, in if it, uh, uh, the the habitats we surveyed are specific to this location. So for more than fringes, this would work well. It would be interesting to try it in other areas. Yeah, uh, but, but the habitats so, don't necessarily. So when you say area, you, you mean 
uh, local to the to the England, for example. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. say Europe or France or. You don't get the habitats there. It's 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 only relevant in these with the, with these habitats. Oh, brush oh, pasture, yeah, things yeah. like that. You, you've got habitats which are unique to this area. Okay. And um, track with other upland areas, so Scotland and places like that, places that you might think are similar. But to be honest, <coughs> um, you would need new. Um, well, we, we, yeah, you, you, you might have some success in other open areas. It'd be probably better going out collecting new training data okay. to be certain. I wouldn't like to trust it. Okay. I know it works in Understood. this area, but not anywhere else. I'd okay. go and collect more data. Understood. Um, okay. And that's it. This is all done in R. I, I can go on to species distribution modeling, but I won't because I can see you're all kind of looking a little bit. No, uh, actually. Um, uh, that is another separate topic, isn't it? This is a separate topic, separate yeah. topic. It's actually longer than the other topic. I, 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 but, okay. but we can talk about that if you want to, any time you like. Um, the difference is that you're looking at um, probability of the habitat being suitable. You can put that, that layer into, a, into another model, which is what I did. So the output of the model is right. being fed into another model yeah. to make inference about suitability of the habitat exactly, for yeah. the been fed in with other, other variables as well. I'll just give you an idea. Yeah, but there be specific to uh, particular species. Yeah, habitat is, is suitable for one species or not. That's right, yeah. yeah. So I did it for five different species. Uh, the five species that I had um, enough data to, to make a model for, basically. Some of them, the more protected ones, didn't see often enough to be able to build a model. Okay. Um, so you need to build another classifier on top of that. Yeah, effectively it becomes a binary classifier. Uh, okay, and then you now overlay the results of this classifier on the geolocation to, to get this smooth uh, mapping. Yeah, I'll, I will, I'll, I'll show you the maps now. So the, the um, I'll zoom it to 100%. Just control 2. Control 2? Two, two. Control 2. Oh, wait. So these are examples of the data that went into the habitat suitability models. All the same area again. That's elevation. So that's elevation of the height in meters. Above sea level. That's good. Okay. You can get that data. These are all open data sources as well, mm. which is really nice. Okay. I think they are anyway. I might even have actually had subscriptions with the university. Elevation data is, is, is in meters, which is great for upland bird. Uh, density of roads. Now, this is an example of using R to, uh, well, actually, this is RGIS, but you can do this in R, um, creating variables from spatial models. So, this is feature engineering. You get your roads um, as a vector layer, so as, as lines, mm -hmm. and then you can create uh, a, a map of road density. So, they all have to be in the same resolution as you, your other predicted variables. So, I use Landsat as my benchmark 30 meters by 30 meters. So this is the density of roads yeah. at a 30 by 30 meter yeah. so pixel level. With the vector data, you, you have now labeled data of roads and buildings and all that. Yeah, but the, it's not labeled. This is a predictor variable. So it's actually, this is a full coverage rust. Oh, you mean, sorry, to create this? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, the UK is brilliant for this. We have something called Mastermap, which is a product that Ordnance Survey provide. And it has vector data for everything. Oh, Everything, right. every road is mapped, every house is mapped, every... You, you could use this as a training data to look for buildings and things like yeah, that. Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. And then apply it elsewhere in the world. You can, but yeah, you could actually, yeah. Yeah, if it's a similar kind of, if you're looking at similar types of builds, you can definitely do that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Valuable. It's valuable, yeah. It's not free, unfortunately, <laughs> master map, but... Um, okay. Yeah, you, yeah, it's an interesting point, transferring it to other parts of the world. Hmm. I guess the only problem with that is you'd have to really, is the background, can you differentiate in the same way as you can in the UK? Right. The background, if you did it in the desert, you probably wouldn't get, it wouldn't be transferable, would it, you know what I mean? Yep. Okay. Of course, because there's no desert here. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So as simple as that. So, yeah, basically, that's it. Uh, so road density, this can all, you know, like all these kind of 
analyses can be done in R or in QGIS, which is that other open source package. If you ever want to do any of this, come and see me, I'll be happy to help you. Number of buildings, so that's density of buildings, which is what we were just yeah. talking about. Canada. Are those the, the information you need to, to find out the of, if these are roads and buildings they are of, have zero probability for the habitat? Is that, is that what Well, saying, the, yeah? the thing is that you, you are interested in, um, it depends on the question you're asking, because it's with the councils, we're interested in the effect of development on, uh, on the bird species. So. Okay. I'll show you. So birds would live happily in our back garden. Potentially. So then Some uh, of them. the probability of uh, having a building doesn't mean anything that is not suitable or not suitable for birds. Uh, well, that's what the model is trying to determine. It's trying to determine are you, will you find birds close to buildings or in the area of, a high, of an area with high density buildings. That's not the actual buildings, that's the density of buildings within 500 metres. So if you look at the house here, within 500 metres of that. Okay. The density is high. There may be no buildings there, but it's still in a high density area. Okay. Will you get a bird there? Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's not just any birds. These are these are waders. I should be showing some pictures of the birds. They're very pretty. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So the the. Okay. Um. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So that's the classification that I did. Um, it's not. No, that's another one. That's that's a uh, another open source data set which is agricultural grade. Don't worry about it. It's just a predictive mm -hmm. variable. Okay. And then the output. So you can prepare to wrap up a little bit. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. The output looks like. So what are the key findings Plus. and the, what are the key contributions and other key findings? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the <laughs> for this the the key the findings are that elevation is, is invariably the best predictor of these these species distributions. Okay, in terms of the habitat distributions or the habitat classifications. It's more inference about the patterns of, of, of the habitats. Um, is, uh, there, there are specific definitions for, um, or sorry, qualitative definitions for the habitats in these areas. Natural England, which are the body that uh, do all the conservation work in the UK, basically. Um, mm -hmm. they, they have a document describing the, 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 the landscape as um, mm -hmm. farmland interspersed with, with upland mm -hmm. areas. Yeah. And it's a matter of seeing whether that's true or not. That was a classification or yeah. part of it. Uh, in terms of this, it's more about um, which, well, I was, um, I was most interested in the variable, the variable importance scores, to be honest, which is these. So these are the five bird species curlew, golden plover, lapwing, snipe, and wheat ear. Okay. One of the questions I wanted to ask was, does supplementing um, empirical data with Landsat data improve your species distribution models? And it does. If it does, the AUC was always higher for these four species here when you added the Landsat data in to when you, when you didn't have it. And people just don't do that. They don't tend to supplement the data. So if you don't region. have Landsat data, what are the variables you already have used? Yeah, they're in there as well. Yeah, they're the ones I've just shown you. Okay. So in the elevation buildings, exactly. All that stuff, stuff, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you can, okay. most you normally build your model based on on those characteristics. Factors. Yeah, exactly. Which you collect from the ground. Yeah, not, not and the you, Landsat. you look at the literature and say, look, this is likely to have a good predictive effect on this species. Uh, and those are listed there. Yeah, they are. Yeah, this is, this is directly from the thesis, so it's not particularly mm. uh, presentation friendly. But uh, that's yeah. If, if you, well, you can see them easier on wheat ear. Wheat ear. Now we're getting into biology here, but wheat ear is um, a different type of bird. Basically, it's a small bird, mm. passerine, perching bird, and the others are, are waders. So they're birds that you find by the sea or the coast, whatever. Mm. A lot of these birds will come up onto the uplands in the breeding season, and that's where they breed. So in the winter, they go back to the coast to feed, and then they come up into the uplands to breed. Yeah. And for those those four species, adding the Landsat data did uh, improve the predictive power of the models, but not for the perching birds. And I'm not quite sure why that is. It's interesting. It could be something to do with the mobility. It could be. It could be all sorts of doing. But yeah, it's, it's interesting that those four. So, so the experts would label that this type of land is good for the for this species. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Land. Well, it becomes a relative probability. The problem is, that you ideally you'd want a dichotomous map. So you'd want you'd use a threshold. Yeah. And you'd say this is suitable. This is unsuitable. But then you're introducing the human element. You use different thresholds. You get different distribution. That's yeah. just completely 
meaningless. Uh, disconnected uh, uh, lane. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, depending region, on which region. Yeah, so it's actually better to use the raw output, the values from the model. Don't threshold it and have a relatively important scope, especially for this kind of work where a council wants to know, they need to build ten thousand houses. Mm. We have certain areas that we think we want to develop in, which which is going to have the least impact. So then you can look at this and say, well, this is the least suitable area, or this is less suitable than that area, and it's a good tool for for councils uh, development tool. Mm -hmm. That's basically what what that's all about. Um, in terms of modeling algorithms, I tried 10 different algorithms. So you've got artificial neural networks, classification trees, random forest, blah, blah, blah. Random forest and generalized boosting models always came up at the top. They, would always be, they should be the go-to algorithms, basically, for this kind of work. So you didn't try like, XGBoost, which is I did. Today, right? Well, no, I tried it for my, um, uh, for my classification. Did it work better? No, random forest was, uh, was on par with random forest. Not much better at all. If I don't know, I think it's better actually if it's worse. Yeah. It maybe depends on a lot of factors there. I'm sure it does. Yeah. And the power of the tuning. But if you don't have the resources or the inclination of the time, mm -hmm. if you're a council working, you don't have the time to tune a model. Then random forest is. Random forest or GBM, yeah. And then you'll get good predictive power from that. As long as you've got enough trees in the forest. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which is the default usually for that. How many? I think it's. I think I set it to a thousand and and very flat, five, flat five. level, very flat hierarchy. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. How many levels? Uh, I can't remember to be honest. I can't remember. What but they are very simple trees. They have the very simple trees. Yeah, most of these are left at the default for this. Is is the, there is zero tuning for most of the models, other than just leaving it at default. Yeah. Right. Interesting. It's interesting, but obviously they can be improved quite a lot through tuning. Okay. Um, but that's not the point of the exercise. That's not the point of this this, this particular exercise. It's a matter of okay. out of the box, can the council use this as a as a tool to okay to enhance development? Right. Yeah. It sounds lazy. <laughs> you got to remember that it's just, it isn't a machine. It's not. This isn't a machine learning PhD. This is a PhD that utilizes machine learning for real world problems. So it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah, okay. in some ways it's lazy. In other ways. It's not, and it's, this is. It's <laughs> all right. There is tuning that went on for the algorithms, but yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>